And good morning. Welcome to Trinity Episcopal Parish's discussion of the history of Christian worship. Last week, we began talking about baptism. What is baptism? Why is it important? Well, if you watched last week, we talked about baptism as a form of initiation in which someone who is not a part of a group is being brought out of the group where they were and being put into, grafted into, a new group. The initiation described last week includes even uh, as eloquent a description as Paul's own description of we are being grafted into Christ, we are leaving our prior commitments and we are being joined into the body of Christ. Therefore, there's no longer distinction between any of us, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male and female, so on and so forth. This week, we're going to talk more functionally, more practically, about the arising of certain kinds of rites, R-I-T-E-S, certain kinds of rituals associated with baptism. We find ourselves again by our baptismal font here as we use in the Episcopal Church, but we also have a couple of other items right here that we'll be getting into that have historical Christian use and carry with it particular signs and symbols that endure even until today. But as might be the case when you join a congregation for a baptism, there are certain kinds of ritual, certain kinds of signs, certain kinds of symbols that are employed that will be different depending on what kind of church you attend. Here in the U.S., where denominational culture is very strong, you will experience a completely different kind of baptismal ritual if you go to a Baptist church or an evangelical free church, then if you go to a Roman Catholic church, an Eastern Orthodox church, or an Episcopal church such as this one. Why do we have different functional rituals? Why do we have different orders that we do things in? Why do we have different stuff that is used, and why is that important? Well, we got a little taste of it last week, but it has to do with how Christians have historically done baptisms. Last week, we talked about the Didache in its kind of guidance as to how we do baptisms. It's um, textbook examples of you fast, you pray, you are anointed, you are baptized, and the Apostolic Constitutions as well last week was an example of a more elaborate set where one is fasting, one is anointed with oil, not once but twice, once for the, confer once for the confer confirmation of the Holy Spirit and once as a sign of the new covenant of which they are under, and of course the baptism where in which they are baptized in the triune name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, having water poured over their head three times. But you'll see there's a difference between the way that the Didache describes things and the way the Apostolic Constitutions describe things. Guess what, friends? That's nothing new. We always have different ways in which we uh, constantly um, adjust ritual. In fact, one of the things that Christian worship always does is it is always contextual. It is contextual because it is something that has to be meaningful for the people who are undergoing the ritual process in which they are being brought into Christ. They are really being a part of the body of Christ through their baptism, but we have different ways in which we perform the ritual of that aspect. And so today we are going to talk about early Christian baptisms. We commonly refer to it as the patristic period, uh, the part of the church fathers. And we're going to be going a little bit into the Middle Ages or the medieval time period. And we're going to show you how different ages and different places in the world actually do baptisms differently. Now, it in no way, shape, or form is going to look like modern baptisms. We're going to get there. 
but you'll see the building blocks as to where, how we get to where we get. Let's start with some of the patristic time period. The Didache is the chief text that we talk about as it comes to the first century. Again, we talked about how the Didache is probably written somewhere between 55 AD and 90 AD, a very early document, but we also have theologians who write about baptisms as well. One of our early theologians that writes about baptisms is Tertullian. Tertullian writes about baptism, and the baptism that he describes is one that has ritual elements in it that might sound familiar if you've read the Didache or if you've read the uh, or if you watched last week. But notice he has a certain order in which things are to be done. What does Tertullian say? Tertullian starts just like the Didache and just like the Apostolic Constitution says is that the person has to go through teaching. They have to be handed on the teaching of the apostles. They have to be handed on the teaching of Jesus. But then, in the baptismal rite itself, we have a prayer over the water. A prayer over the water that's actually being used in baptism. So it's not just like we have any kind of water, we have a prayer over the water. Then, the person renounces the devil. They say that they are turning away from Satan and all of his works. Then they have a threefold profession of faith and a threefold submersion or immersion under the water. They profess their faith three times. They are submerged or immersed three times. And then they are anointed with oil in the sign of the cross on their foreheads. Then they have hand laying, so whoever does the baptism lays their hands on their head like this, says a prayer over them, and then they are incorporated into the assembly in the act of taking the Lord's Supper or the Holy Eucharist. So what are the things that Tertullian describes? Well, think about it. It's a little bit different. So teaching is the same. You have to be taught, you have to be taught but then you have additional things. Prayer over the water is a new one. Praying over the actual water being used. Then you have renunciation of something. Someone is renouncing something. They're not simply um, taking up their cross and following Jesus, I believe in Jesus Christ, but they are actually saying what they do not believe. They are saying that they renounce the forces of evil in the world, Satan and all of his works. And then instead of there being a threefold pouring of water over the head or a submersion, they are professing their faith and being submerged three times as well. So again, Trinitarian symbolism being used, right? And then they are anointed with holy oil in the sign of the cross. Now, if you remember from last week, oil is seen as a specific symbol, meaning the presence of either, um, in the Apostolic Constitutions, the presence of the Holy Spirit or the signing of the New Covenant, of which they are under. Now, it's not exactly clear which one Tertullian means by this, but nonetheless, there is an anointing with holy oil. So we have another element in here, right? We have water, of course, um, the water being poured over, being submerged. We also have oil being added, right? So different symbolic things being added to the rite. And of course, this entire thing is a description of a ritual. It is an ordered set of symbol, like we talked about in the first episode. That's what Tertullian says. But there are other examples during this time period that you can find that describe certain approaches. One of them is also Cyprian of Carthage. What kinds of things does Cyprian describe? Well, Cyprian speaks about this generally. Um, the features from, uh, uh, the functional features from Cyprian is that chrism being sanctified on the altar. So you notice that there are two, there are two 
vials of oil here. Chrism is a special kind of oil that is consecrated by the bishop. Now, for you who have come from liturgical traditions, you might recognize uh, why this is important. For you who don't, let's talk about what exactly we mean by this. Chrism is something that is a special oil being sanctified by the bishop specifically to be used for baptisms. And part of this is, is because the bishop in liturgical churches, especially in the Episcopal Church or in the Roman Catholic Church or in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the bishop is the person in which you are being grafted into the church through. I, as the priest, am a part of the Diocese of Arkansas as an Episcopal priest, but it is the bishop in whose charge I am under who is the person who admits someone into the fold. This is why, symbolically, the bishop has a crozier or a shepherd's staff that he carries whenever he or she is here, and also um, carries with them or consecrates with them chrism to be used during baptisms. This is something that Cyprian writes about, about the chrism being consecrated on the altar, and that bishops impose hands on the baptized to receive the Holy Spirit, because the bishops for Cyprian are the inheritors of the apostles' teaching. It's not simply that anybody does this, but that the bishops who are the direct representatives and inheritors of the apostles' teaching and fellowship through Jesus Christ and the direct line of succession from Christ are the ones to confer the Holy Spirit. So Cyprian writes over chrism, consecrated by the bishop, and the hands of the bishop being laid. So remember, uh, Tertullian talks about hand laying, but Cyprian talks about hand laying as being a part of the baptism, being accepted into the communion of saints. Now Cyprian also has a couple of things that he talks about theologically. Cyprian defends what we refer to as infant baptism. And the reason why Cyprian defends infant baptism is because Cyprian has a different understanding as to what baptism actually is that, in a lot of ways, is very biblical. If you think about, the, um, if you think about Cornelius in the book of Acts that Peter is sent to, to proclaim the gospel, it is said that Cornelius and his whole household were baptized. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, in the culture in which we're speaking into, the head of the household, the um, faith and religion that they follow is the faith and religion of which the entire family is to follow as well. Very similar in the uh, realm of the emperor of Rome, the religion of the emperor is the religion of the people, or even, uh, in, uh, even all the way up into the modern age in the 1500s and 1600s, the religion of the king or the queen is the religion of their constituents. Um, so on and so forth. Um, and it plays out in many ways uh, sociologically and politically in how these things work themselves out. But in the household, the head of the household, which was seen as in this time the man, Whatever religion he's a part of is the religion of the rest of the household. That's one way that we can explain this. But nonetheless, Cornelius and all of his household was baptized. And by necessity, that can be extended to his children, the children of, his, uh, of, his, um, of the people who lived with him, his grandparents if they, if they should be living with him, so on and so forth. And so Cyprian points out that baptism in this sense in the book of Acts, in this particular instance, is being grafted in as a family into the community of faith in the body of Christ. That the faith that is being communicated is one in which infants also are being brought up in. So the way that Cyprian might say this is that the um, child is being brought up in the faith by those who are entrusting to this child the faith. They are, in fact, uh, the parents are charged with teaching the child in the faith. And so 
um, Cyprian talks about the uh, defense of infant baptism. And of course, if Cyprian's talking about the defense of infant baptism, this is happening in a widespread manner. This is important enough that he writes about this theologically. And so, maybe contrary to uh, what you might have, what you might uh, understand, baptism within the context of Holy Scripture is not nearly as uh, decisive as someone who is making a choice in faith. Um, even in the early Christian communities, there was debate over this, hence why Cyprian of Carthage writes this theologically. So, if you immediately blanch at the thought of infant baptism, again, remember, there are different conceptions as to what baptism is. And this it can be argued from a biblical foundation. Hence, this is why the largest um, constitu uh, constituent parts of the church today, such as the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, practice infant baptism because of the church fathers and mothers that wrote over why we do infant baptisms as a form of initiation and not merely by a proving of one's faith. That, friends, is something that those churches practice as something called confirmation. Confirmation is the owning of one's own faith and being initiated fully into the life of the church as a self uh, as a self-professed believer. Now, again, for those of you who haven't grown up in traditions like that, that may seem wild um, that this is the case. But let's move on to the next one, and you'll see where this idea of confirmation might start to come from. Hippolytus is another person who writes over this in the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus. Now, this is written in the fourth century. This is probably a description as to how Rome is doing things at the time. But notice the practical aspects of this rite. What does baptism look like in Hippolytus's language? Prayer over the water. So again, for Tertullian having an effect in the, in the fourth century. Blessing over the oil, so a prayer being said over the oil. Remember how we just talked about Cyprian talking about the blessing of the chrism on the altar, the blessing over the oil. Now we have something different. We have the exorcism of the candidate. This little thing right here is salt. The description of exorcism is interesting because um, Whereas in Tertullian, you have a renunciation of Satan, in Hippolytus, you have a driving out of an evil force from the person um, through exorcism. And the salt right here being a sign of purity, it's a symbol of purity. Um, for anybody who has watched, um, uh, like for example, uh, Supernatural, um, a, a, a series, drama series, um, on some of our networks, um, guess what the main uh, thing that they use to uh, fight demonic forces with? It's usually salt. Well, salt has a use in the early church as being a purifying agent. And the salt being placed both on the person's tongue, the person's head, to exorcise the evil force to exercise all of that which is evil out of the person so that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit can indwell. It's another interesting element that's added to the water and to the oil. So again, you have another ritual aspect to this being added. This is what Hippolytus writes about. Threefold immersion. So again, we have a holdover from, from Tertullian, a threefold immersion, one, two, three. Um, and notice that this is an immersion. This is not a submersion. So it's not simply a putting someone under the water. It is a pouring of water over someone's head, usually inside of a, a, a big thing of water already. Um, so you have a different kind of baptism being practiced right here, or kind of, of a water bath being done right here. Then you have, after the water bath, after the baptism, the anointing. Again, the chrismation that Cyprian talks about. And then the entry into the church. It's interesting how um, what happens in uh, Hippolytus is that you gather at a space other than the church to begin with, 
and then symbolically you are brought into the building symbolizing that you are being grafted into the body of the church and you are then have you have your head with the bishop's hands placed upon it so again the laying on of hands by the bishop and you pray with the gathered church the gathered assembly you receive the sign of peace the kiss of peace which is said in in, in the end of first peter and of paul's letters the kiss of peace from the bishop welcoming you in as a brother or sister and then you have the kiss of peace with the congregation being grafted in as a brother or sister and then you have the holy eucharist then you have the lord's supper in which everyone partakes so Notice, another element is being used, an exorcism is added. You have the water bath still, three times in the triune formula. You have the anointing with chrism that is consecrated by the bishop. You are brought into the church in a symbolic act of being grafted in, and then the bishop lays hands on this person to then complete the grafting in by the acceptance through, again, the apostolic line of which the bishop shares a part of. So this rite, this ritual process, again, you see how elaborate this process is. You see how different the symbol is that's being communicated in this, especially the interesting symbol of being outside the church when this happens and then being brought into the church building, symbolically showing that we're becoming a part of something. But also the exorcism driving away a spiritually evil force so that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit can indwell therein. This is what Hippolytus says. So you're, you're seeing that there's a general shape that, 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 that is uh, coming into the liturgy. Um, and that general shape is that you're having several elements. In the early church, you have several different ritual elements that will survive uh, by and large, until we get to the modern time period. And that is the ritual symbols of the water in the same area as the oil being used for anointing of the Holy Spirit and an exorcism. So the early church's use of the baptismal rite, maybe it might surprise you, is very elaborate very ritual heavy, very symbol heavy, right? Things that are meaningful to the ways in which people are being incorporated into the body of Christ, and nonetheless are being taken from the foundation of scripture, but also being used in a new way. The oil for anointing um, is the oil for, uh, the oil for anointing, um, where does oil show up in the, in the Bible? Well, oil for anointing shows up in the Old Testament when kings are anointed. Well, what happens when kings are anointed? The Holy Spirit dwells them, right? So oil being a sign of the Holy Spirit. So you can see how this symbol then gets used in a new way in the baptismal rites of the early church. And again, salt, ritual purity, and salt being used as a symbol and sign of the driving away, the purifying of someone of an evil force. So, again, it's very elaborate, isn't it? Well, now we move a little bit into where some of the differences start showing up. So in the early church, um, as some of you probably are aware, the Greek-speaking East and the Latin-speaking West begin to grow apart due to sociopolitical reasons, due to language, just having different languages, and practice as well starts to differentiate itself. In the East, you will normatively have at this time period a particular order in which you do things, and in the West likewise as well. In the East, you will anoint the person, you will then baptize them in water, and you will anoint them a second time. So it goes anointing prior, baptism, anointing after. In the West, you have, for the most part, an anointing and then a baptism, and then an anointing. But in the West, a little bit of a different thing takes shape. 
So in the East, we have anoint, bathe, anoint, so to speak. What do we have in the West? In the West, we have the importance of the second anointing beginning to take shape into something that I referred to earlier as confirmation. When bishops start having their uh, regions that they're taking care of get so large that they have priests who are serving at their particular charge, such as I do here in Searcy, Arkansas, while the Bishop of Arkansas has many parishes that he is in charge of, because the bishop can't be there all the time, in the West, the laying on of hands was restricted to only the bishop. In the East, the priest who does the anointing could also do the hand laying. Now, why is this important? In the West, several scholars have pointed out that this is probably where we have a symbol that gets detached from its original uh, meaning and takes on a new meaning. And part of why we say that this is a sacramental act uh, that is anew is mostly because um, a couple of people write about it, like St. Augustine of Hippo, writes about the importance of the second anointing and the handling of the bishop being the constitutive act that brings people into the church. So what happens when you don't have the bishop there who is the one that does the constitutive act of the second anointing and the handling? Well, it becomes a ritual in and of itself. So here's what happens, as best as we can tell. We have in the West the baptism, the anointing, the exorcism. But after the baptism, the person is brought into the church. They're brought into, they're incorporated into the church in, a, in, in that sort of way. But the bishop still has to do the chrismation and the handling to complete the rite. So when bishops come to visit different parishes, or even uh, very memorably, when they are traveling certain places, um, they are confirming people. They are confirming people's baptisms. That's where the idea of confirm, uh, the name confirmation comes from. They are confirming people's baptisms um, by the hand laying that they that they do in the conferring of the Holy Spirit by their hands. Again, this is a difference between the East and the West. The East, the priests would be able to do the hand laying. Um, on behalf of the bishop. In the West, only the bishops did this, which is why when you go to the Episcopal Church, when you go to the Roman Catholic Church, when you go to the Eastern Orthodox Church, you will see something akin to a second anointing that happens. But in more traditional Roman Catholic churches and in the Anglican Communion as a whole, which the Episcopal Church is a part of, you will see bishops performing something called the rite of confirmation. They are confirming the baptisms of the people who come to them. So if you're wondering why uh, you have this thing in some churches called confirmation, that's where this rite comes from, and that's where this sacramental act comes from, because it's part and parcel of a sacramental act of baptism. But in the early church, that was something that was part and parcel of the whole thing, which is why when the bishop comes to perform a baptism, the person who is baptized as an adult is confirmed at the same time. So you kind of see how that works. But historically, it has precedent. It doesn't come from nowhere. It builds on what we see the early church in the patristic time period doing. But again, we have the patristics that are our foundation for how we deal with these things. And you see how the different elements all of a sudden start coming into play. Well, what starts happening when we move to the, to the medieval time period? In the medieval time period, you have a carrying on of a similar thing. One of the foundational documents that we in the Episcopal Church and the Roman Catholic Church use as a primary Western document is something called the Gelasian Sacramentary. Now, that's a whole bunch of things that you just don't need to, you don't, there's not going to be a test at the end over this. But what you need to know about the Gelasian Sacramentary is that this is an 8th century document, a 
approximately. So this is the 700s, this is maybe the 800s. But what is the baptismal rite of the Gelasian Sacramentary? Well, guess what? You're going to see a lot. You're going to see a lot of familiar practices in the eighth century. Exorcism. That's one part of this rite. Then you have something called the ethata, which, by the way, is the word that Jesus used to loose the tongue or to open the mouth of a mute man. Be opened is what epatha means, but epatha, with the salt being placed upon the tongue of the person, is used as an exorcism of something, a driving out of an evil spirit. So again, we have an exorcism within the baptismal rite. Then what do you have? You have the blessing of the font, the blessing of the water that is going to be used for the baptism. You have the profession of faith of the person that is being that that is being brought into the the baptismal community of Christ of Christ's body. Then you have a threefold dipping. Again, this threefold formula survives. You have a signing with the cross. You have the handling and anointing by the bishop. So the thing is, again, in the West, the bishop is the one who confirms in this case. And then the liturgy continues with the Lord's Supper. So remember this, friends, because this is what the features of the Western Rite are really built on. And it has to do with the early church in the patristic time period. These elements that seem um, so foreign to some of us today in the Western Church of the 21st century were actually organic things that began to be expressed within the ritual of the liturgy, the ritual of the worship of baptism. What are those, what are those pieces of ritual? Well, in summary, friends, you have these big things that are parts of the ritual of baptism. You have the water bath, the actual water in which people are submerged or immersed in a trifold formula or even a trifold dipping. They go under three times and come back up, or they're poured over three times, the triune formula. So we have that. But also we have the use of holy oils, of chrism, consecrated by the bishop on the altar, like Cyprian said. But we also have an exorcism that is accompanied by these things in the ritual of baptism. But also the big one that I mentioned that I haven't talked about a whole lot yet is after you're baptized, you receive Holy Communion. You are then brought in by the reception of the Lord's Supper of the Holy Eucharist as part of the whole of the faith then. So in the initiation rites of the early church, you have various elements that are added to the ritual, uh, to, to the ritual that you're that you're seeing, but they're done in a very organic and faithful fashion. They don't come from nowhere. They are meant to symbolize certain things. They are meant to um, not only do that. They are meant to participate in the reality of these things. That's what symbols are. Remember, they participate in the reality of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Bearing in Christ's death and raised in his resurrection. The driving out of, the, of evil within us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Of the dying and rising with Christ, but also of the partaking of Christ's body and blood in the ritual of the Lord's Supper. That, friends, is what you can functionally see within the rituals of holy baptism throughout all of these things. That's what functionally you will see whenever people refer to what the early church did as it comes to practical matters. They practically used tangible substances to confer these various mysteries of the Christian faith. And 
whether you think that this is wild and whether you think this is necessary doesn't necessarily matter. What does matter, though, is that these are the actual rituals that were present within the Christian communities we looked at. From the close of the canon in the Didache, leading all the way up to the 8th century at the turn into the medieval time period, where we get the Gelasian Sacramentary, which a foundational document for us in the Western Church has all of these elements put in it. They're put in a specific order, using for specific symbolic purposes, participating in the reality of Christ's saving work, but they are done in an organic fashion that grew out of the actual tradition itself. Thank you so much, friends, for joining for this uh, particular discussion and continuing discussion of the baptismal rites of the early church. Next time, you can anticipate us going fully into the medieval time period and making it to the modern time period where some of the more modern baptismal rites will begin to, to come to the surface. But hopefully, friends, you uh, begin to recognize how that the church, rather than um, grabbing things from nowhere, actually organically has built off of the traditions that were handed down even from the earliest church itself. And whether or not you are a part of a tradition that, per that practices using some of these things or not, something that you can recognize is that these types of ritual formula still exist in our churches today. Thank you for joining us today, friends. As always, be safe and may God bless you.